Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's great to be with you on this Friday, the 13th of May. And tonight, we're talking about some scary situations affecting women and families. First, the baby formula shortage. Supplies are taking multiple hits, including a factory shutdown. A House committee will investigate solutions, but what should parents do now? We'll talk to a pediatrician who's guiding families through this crisis. Then, the abortion debate is prompting more questions about women's health. Two OBGYNs join us to answer some of your questions just ahead. Also, Ukraine's first war crimes trial against a Russian soldier is getting underway. Meanwhile, Ukrainian officials say Russian forces are withdrawing from one key city. We'll have the latest from Kyiv. And tonight's Inspiring America takes us to the highest point on Earth. You'll meet the youngest American woman to reach the summit of Mount Everest. It's Friday. Today's probably payday for lots of parents. But even if they had a million bucks, they could not buy formula for their babies tonight. Can't buy it because they can't find it. As of Sunday, about 43% of American retailers were out of formula. Back in November, it was just 11%. This shortage started early in the pandemic, one of many supply chain snags. But this February, Abbott Laboratories, a major formula manufacturer, issued a voluntary recall following complaints of bacterial infections that made some infants very sick. The recall led to a plant shutdown in Michigan and an FDA investigation. Today, President Biden said the White House is working on meeting this need, including considering a boost of imports. The FDA has been looking at the will be working with manufacturers to facilitate the incorporation of formulas from abroad that, in fact, in places like Europe, where we can get more product on U.S. shelves. That's underway. I think we're going to be in a matter of weeks or less getting significantly more formula on shelves. This is a process. We're working on it very, very hard. There's nothing more urgent we're working on than that right now. On Capitol Hill, the House Oversight Committee has opened an investigation into the issue. The committee's leaders wrote to the heads of four baby formula companies requesting details about the shortage. A letter from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi out today adds that the House Appropriations Committee will hold a hearing on the shortage next week. In a moment, we'll hear from a pediatrician who is guiding parents through this crisis. But let's begin with NBC Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Rafa starting us off tonight. And Ali, tell us more about the actions we might see Congress take in the coming days. Yeah, Joshua, well, you laid it out perfectly there how dire this situation has become for, we know, the roughly 75 percent of parents who use formula to feed infants or young children. And this issue has really taken front and center recently and really over the last two or three days on Capitol Hill. And Congress is really demanding answers as to how this crisis got this bad. Uh, they took a number of steps this week, the first of which, as you mentioned, that House Appropriations Committee uh, launching an investigation working on drafting some legislation that could possibly lead to an emergency funding package. The number of that funding is still unknown right now, but it could include money that could go to the FDA to handle uh, this crisis quicker. The committee is also considering uh, importing formula from Europe, FDA approved companies in Europe, uh, and lawmakers say they will discuss that in a hearing slated for May 19th right now. The following week on May 25th, you have the Energy and Commerce Committee that We'll hold another hearing to explore really how this crisis got this bad and solutions as to what could be what could be put in place so that it doesn't ever happen again, according to that letter from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Today, also more than 30 Senate Democrats sent a letter uh, to the Infant Nutrition Council uh, pushing manufacturers to address the shortage as soon as possible. There are some other actions here. The House Oversight Committee, as you mentioned at the top there, launching an investigation into what can possibly be done to make this supply, uh, really regenerate the supply. And they, as you mentioned, sent letters to the 
the heads of those four formula companies uh, that make up roughly 90 percent of the nation's formula supply. And they also want to uh, really investigate how to alleviate the price gouging that families are seeing. Uh, I, I read one article that uh, listed a can of formula of uh, at upwards of $120. So this is truly unprecedented. I've even seen uh, senators really tweeting numbers of health hotlines or that government website that the uh, White House announced today for families just to have some resources as to get some answers. We know that families have been told not to ration formula, not to water it down. So there are a lot of questions parents have right now that the White House uh, may not be uh, answering. And so they are turning, Congress is saying that they will be able to uh, provide the answers. So really Congress stepping up to the front lines of this battle, Joshua. Yeah, no, I know there are a few requests, like from Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, to use the Defense Production Act to try to get more baby formula produced. Is that something that's being seriously contemplated? Is she just kind of throwing out ideas? Like, how much leverage does the federal government have to kind of force more baby formula to get made? Yeah, Senator Gillibrand says she's heard from dozens of her constituents uh, really telling their emotional stories as to their, their personal experiences with this. She says this is a life or death situation for many babies across the country. And we saw the Defense Production Act put into place during COVID uh, with masks. This is this act that allows the government to instruct private manufacturers to boost production of goods for the federal government's use. Uh, White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain actually says that the White House is seriously considering implementing this. It's still unclear why the White House hasn't done so uh, so far. But there are also several Republicans that are coming out and calling for this, and they're slamming the Biden administration for not taking any action sooner. They say that they've seen photos online of stores across the U.S.-Mexico border uh, with pallets and pallets of baby formula, while stores, uh, in, while shelves in grocery stores across the United States just remain completely empty. So this is uh, really something that the White House is trying to figure out how to alleviate. We know that President Biden met with those uh, executives from those four companies uh, yesterday, Joshua. He's considering importing that formula, like I mentioned. He's also urging states to open more resources for families. Uh, and he's actually calling on the Federal Trade Commission and state's attorneys general to crack down on this price gouging. But the White House still doesn't have any timing as to when these uh, these improvements, these called for improvements could be put into place. We've heard from Abbott, uh, the company that said that even when the company starts uh, ramping up production of the formula, it's going to take another right. eight weeks for that to hit uh, grocery store shelves. So there are still a lot of families struggling. And what's making this even worse is, you know, we know the in insanely inflated gas prices right now. We've heard of so many families driving hours and hours, hundreds of miles uh, to try and find formula. So the gas prices on top of this, it's just truly uh, adding up to a terrible situation for families across the country. It is indeed. Yes. Thank you, Ali. That's NBC Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Rafa starting us off tonight. Now let's focus on those parents that Ali was mentioning who are desperately searching for formula right now. Some are using online groups to swap formulas with other parents. Others are making frequent trips to the store, hoping to be there when they restock. Also, some social media posts have recipes for homemade baby formula. This is very risky. The American Academy of Pediatrics warns against it strongly. But it's easy to see why some parents are trying whatever they can think of. Jason in Washington is a new parent. He told NBC News he feels like he's playing Russian roulette with his baby's formula, unsure what the little guy's allergic to. Jason calls the constant search for new formulas really scary. Jessica is a new mother who cannot breastfeed because she takes anti-seizure medication. She said it makes her feel like she's failing her child, helplessly unable to feed them. So what can you do right now? And what alternatives should you avoid? Let's continue now with Dr. Magna Diaz, a pediatrician with Yale Medicine in Bridgeport, Connecticut. She's also an associate term professor at the Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Diaz, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. What are some of the parents you've been talking to lately telling you about what they've been dealing with trying to find formula? Yeah, I think as pediatricians where we're feeling um, 
fielding the most questions and really seeing the most um, critical shortages is with specialty formulas. So babies that really have to take a particular formula because they have an allergy or a special medical condition that requires them to have one particular formula in general and don't have the ability to switch. What are some of the big things that you're advising parents to consider or to avoid? We saw that warning from the, we heard that warning from the American Academy of Pediatrics about homemade formulas that they say are just not a good idea. Yeah, so I would say in terms of what to do, realize that most formulas for most babies that don't have a special need really are fairly interchangeable. So whether that's your baby's on a cow-based formula or a plant-based formula, you can switch those up. You can pick a different um, brand, including the store brands. They're very similar in terms of their composition. And so if you find a different brand, it's absolutely fine to go ahead and use that. There have also been some homemade recipes circulating online. Uh, from the little that I've read, it seems like the homemade recipes may have, you know, ingredients that seem logical, like, you know, milk. Babies need milk. Mother's milk. Yes, let's just try milk from the store. But there's a lot more in baby formula besides just milk that makes trying to m use a recipe from online really quite dangerous. Absolutely. And so I think, you know, the formula companies have really it's been a science, right, to try to duplicate what babies need that comes in that perfect form of breast milk. And that takes not only a lot of work to duplicate exactly what nutrients they need and in the right balance, but it also takes a lot of work to make sure that there's not germs like bacteria and viruses that are contaminating um, our, our milk supply. And so, you know, pasteurizing things and really making sure that it is exactly what your baby needs to grow. I can completely understand why a parent who's desperate would want to look online to look at these things. But there are several things that are very dangerous for parents to do. One is homemaking formula. The other is watering down formula. Not only will it not give your baby the nutrients that they need to grow, but it can also cause imbalances in their electrolytes in their blood that could cause the baby to have seizures and get very, very sick. So we don't want to do that. And we don't want to give babies other forms of milk, just cow's milk or um, you know, other almond milk, other for, uh, milks that are available that would be for older kids. With regard to breastfeeding, the CDC says that about 84% of babies are breastfed at some point in their lives. Just under half received exclusively breast, breastfed milk as, breast milk as of three months old, about 25% at six months. So the need for formula is pretty clear there. I've heard of some women who are considering providing breast milk for other families, that they would use a breast pump and and make milk available for families who can't find baby formula. What do you, what do you make of that? So there are um, uh, donor banks for human milk. And the good thing about the getting milk from a donor bank, besides the fact that it's fairly expensive, is that that milk has been screened for um, different diseases and then it's been pasteurized. So they even check for things like COVID um, and coronavirus in the breast milk. So that's a pretty safe thing to do. Getting milk from somebody else um, where the milk has not been pasteurized or screened for um, infections does have a little bit of risk to it. With regard to the actions that the government is taking, what do you think that the patients you've talked to, the families you've talked to, would like to see the government do the most? Are there particular areas where you think the need is the greatest or certain perhaps communities among whom the needs are greatest right now? Yes, yeah, so I would say again that the babies that have the specialty formulas that are, you know, that they really can't switch, I think that is the greatest need. I do see just in the past week in my community that we're getting more and more questions from parents and concerns about not being able to find the formula. 
So I would love for all families to be able to have that ability to get the formula that they need. So I'm happy that this has escalated to um, you know, the highest levels, and I really do hope that they take action on this. Dr. Magna Diaz, pediatrician with Yale Medicine. Doctor, I appreciate you making time for us tonight. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And before we continue, we heard Ali Rafa mention their concerns among the, in the federal government about price gouging with regard to milk. Remember, you can report price gouging to the Federal Trade Commission. The website is reportfraud.ftc.gov. There's an online form where you can report all kinds of scams, but this would be among them. Report fraud, all one word, .ftc.gov. The uncertain future of abortion rights is raising lots of questions about women's health. Our panel of OBGYNs will answer some of your questions next. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. The health of America's women will have a lot to do with the future of Roe v. Wade. No wonder so many of you have questions. And a lot is riding on the answers. Our OBGYN panel will answer some of them in a moment, but we're also getting lots of your stories and perspectives on abortion rights. Jerry emailed, I don't totally agree with abortions, but to make abortions illegal would only push abortions to the back alleys where they would be performed by non-trained people. I don't think abortion should be a form of birth control, but if done early, it is better than people dying from botched abortions. Abortions can be made illegal, but they cannot be stopped. Jerry, thank you for sharing that with us. Another viewer writes, I had an abortion because I loved my baby and I didn't want it to be brought into a world that was already so screwed up and that it was going to suffer with its mother. I was only with this man for five months and I was severely stressed, anxious, and depressed. It took years to heal and I can't imagine enduring that for 18 years. Thank you so much for sharing that story. I know that it's hard to talk about these kinds of things, but your courage in telling us what you dealt with means the world to us. And that's why it's so important we get some answers to your questions. Let's get into those with Dr. Alicia Liggett, the founder and executive director of Empower Her Health, and Dr. Jennifer Conti, an adjunct clinical assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Stanford. Good to have both of you with us, and I wonder if we might start with a voicemail from a viewer. Here is what... Sylvia left in our inbox. Listen. I hope that uh, Roe versus Wade is not overturned because a lot of women's lives would be in jeopardy if they have no other means of abortion. They would use hangers or do other things that are uncleanly to uh, be able to do whatever it, is, it, it takes to survive. Sylvia, thank you for sharing your concerns with us. Dr. Liggett, if I could start with you, how would you respond to Sylvia and her concerns about women doing what they feel they need to do to terminate their pregnancies? Yes, well, the first thing I would say is, Sylvia, I see you, I hear you. Um, I have many patients just like you who are frightened, who are scared, who are terrified that, you know, robbing us of this right to choose and to have autonomy over our bodies and also over our families is extremely, extremely, it's, it's frightening. Um, I would also say that it's something that as a country, we really need to come together and decide what is most important to us. Is it important for us to really live out the ideals of democracy and protect those freedoms that we hold dear, which includes having autonomy over our bodies to make decisions for our families or to reinstate uh, systems of control where individuals then have to resort to dangerous measures in order to do what they feel they need to do to survive. When people feel that they're robbed of their basic uh, needs of survival, which include the ability to freely choose whether they want to reproduce or not reproduce, people will feel this sense of urgency and this sense of frustration that they need to do what's necessary. And sometimes those things can be extremely dangerous. Dr. Conti, kind of along that line, we got an email from Denise, and Denise writes, criminal pregnancy, rape, incest, pedophilia, the emotional brokenness begins before the pregnancy is known. 
What is the aftermath when a law prohibits an abortion in these cases and the brokenness just escalates? Denise, thank you for sharing that with us. Dr. Conti, I think she's talking about all the other societal factors, the personal factors, the life factors that are kind of wrapped around the circumstances behind seeking abortion services. Yeah, I think that she sort of hits the nail right on the head when she um, expresses how incredibly complex these situations can be. And that when we work in this field with abortion care, it's never just black and white, we work in the gray. And that's because there's so many different circumstances that go to someone's decision. Um, these situations in particular, I think, are some of the ones that sort of, you know, get me the most when I hear about anti-choice legislation being passed on the state levels, because a lot of these states aren't taking into account even these extreme situations. And I think if you sort of zoom out and take a bigger zoom lens view of what's going on emotionally and mentally as people deal with deciding to have an abortion and, and recover from an abortion, it's worth noting that there's actually an extensive amount of literature that's been done that looks at what happens when you deny people this kind of care. And so I think the bigger focus here is really looking at the mental and emotional health of people and their families after they've been denied abortion care. And we know hands down that it actually fares far worse for these people when they're denied this important care. I hear you, doctor, when you talk about the impact on people and their families. And Dr. Liggett, that kind of gets to the next message we got about family support. Here is what Sherry had to say. I totally feel like if it's me and my body, I have the right to make that choice. <clears throat> I chose not to do it. However, my daughter chose to do it and I supported her and I wouldn't change a thing. Sherry, thank you for sharing your story with us. Dr. Liggett, talk about what you've seen in terms of the roles that families and sort of family, extended family communities play in terms of abortion services. Yes, absolutely. I think uh, this message really speaks to the very important point that this procedure is exceedingly common, that, uh, and also that it's a very polarizing issue. We know that nearly a quarter of all individuals uh, will undergo this procedure at some point in their lifetime. And although, you know, we may not make that decision for ourselves, there are certainly, and, and, this, and the math really supports that, there are certainly individuals in our families, in our, in our circles of friends uh, and colleagues who will at some point undergo this procedure, who will choose to make that choice for their families. And so I think it really does speak to that point that you know, it's something that's very personal, something that's very private, and often how people arrive at the decision to terminate a pregnancy is often one that's done in confidence with their families and with their doctors. Um, and it should really remain that way. There are all sorts of reasons why people may choose to terminate a pregnancy, but it's really not up to our government or really up to anyone for that matter to decide who is deserving and who is undeserving of that right. I should note, by the way, we did get a number of stories from people who made an array of decisions with regards to, with regard to pregnancy. Some of you shared stories of aborting a pregnancy. Some, like Caroline, shared your stories of deciding to continue your pregnancy. Here's what Caroline left in our inbox. I got pregnant later in life with my husband's baby, and that's fine. We were excited. But one day my doctor called me and told me, that the tests that were run said that I was going to have a Downs baby. It wasn't 100% sure, and I could have an abortion if I wanted to. I decided not to and get my chances with God. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And Dr. Conti, clearly her faith played a factor in her decision, which is fine. But I wonder what you would say to women who are thinking through their options with regards to pregnancy, particularly if there is a concern about the health of the baby, whether the baby might have a congenital issue or, or other health challenges they would have to face for their lives. What, what kind of questions, what kind of thought process would you recommend that that, that women consider when they're thinking this through. I, I actually love that story. Oh, sorry. 
Um, I love that story because it brings in faith and it brings in her family and it brings in a lot of her, uh, what's important in her decision-making process. And it also <coughs> highlights the fact that this is about choice. And so if someone decides that regardless of the situation, abortion isn't the right choice for them, that is absolutely their choice. And that's what we as physicians wanna do and support. But the problem is when you make harmful legislation like this, you sort of take this one size fits all approach and say that no matter what each individual circumstance is, this is gonna be the law and we're gonna take that choice out of it. So I, I love that she brought that up and I love that we sort of look at this from a holistic approach because faith and family are very important when we make these decisions. Let me get to let me get to a few more comments with the time we have left. Another viewer wrote, why is it we never talk about aspects such as medication, stillbirth, and other medical reasons an abortion could save the life of the mother? All we ever hear about is the stereotypical wasn't ready to have a baby story, which is just as valid, but not the only reason, and paints a picture to anti-abortioners that abortion is being justified as some kind of irresponsible serial birth control. Let's get to one more story in the time we have left. Here is what Justice had to say. Listen. I had um, one pregnancy that went horribly wrong, and I had planned to give the child up for adoption. I had serious health issues, including a tendency towards blood clots. Um, and my life was endangered by that pregnancy and a second one that only lasted a few weeks. I then went and had an abortion the second time. I also had a DNC and I had my tubes tied, though I had to leave my home state to get my tubes tied because I was under 30 at the time and they wouldn't do it. Wow, Justice, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thanks to all the women who have shared your stories with us. Regardless of your decisions, I know this is a tough topic to talk about. I know a lot of people don't wanna talk about this, but. These are stories that are worth hearing, and we're just honored that you trusted us with your story. Thank you so very much. I will say, doctors, and I'd love you both to answer this before we go, I'm super disappointed that more men did not share questions. We asked the guys, like, hey, there's a lot we need to know about women's health that is not even on our radar. I'm hyper disappointed that not one guy had the guts to ask what he was thinking. So, fellas, that's on you. You, you, you played yourself. You had a chance to ask a question in, in a non-judgmental form, and now I get to judge you for not asking the question. Could I ask you each, please, before we go, what is the one thing that you wish more men understood about women's health, but we don't even know to ask? What we don't, it's not even on our radar. Dr. Conti, what's the one thing you wish more men knew about women's health? Um, you know, I think you said it very well. I think that we men sort of shortchange themselves sometimes when they think that they aren't active uh, decision makers in this as well. And that goes back to whether it's a male figure in someone's family, their father, their, uh, maybe, you know, a close brother, uncle, the partner in a relationship, if they're in a heterosexual relationship. I think if you look at the big picture again, we are all in this together. And if we sort of brand this as only a women's only issue, we sort of, you know, step away and say, well, that's not my problem to worry about. But in truth, we're all in this together. Um, so, so I like the idea of getting everyone more involved um, because it's all of our problems. And Dr. Liggett, before we go, what's the one thing you wish more men knew about women's health? Yeah, I mean, I think I wish more men really understood that this is really a human rights issue, that women's health is a human issue and as human beings uh, that have experiences in this country that are citizens of this nation and that are committed to ensuring and protecting the freedoms that our democracy affords us, everybody should care about this issue. Everybody should be completely enraged when we see uh, erosions of our rights, um, of our precious democracy in this country. So I think, you know, in terms specifically of women's health, Dr. Conti and also yourself said it perfectly, that uh, men are also part of families. They're part of communities. Uh, they're part of uh, they're part of the, the conversation. Um, and although we as medical professionals sometimes don't do a great job of including them, it is important that they assert themselves, ask their questions, be a part of the conversation, come to visits to doctors' visits with their loved ones, and be informed about what these issues really mean for their families. Dr. Alicia Liggett of Empower Her Health and Dr. Jennifer Conti of Stanford, 
I appreciate you both answering our questions and responding to some of these stories tonight. Thank you both very, very much. My pleasure. Up next, we head to Ukraine. It just launched its first war crimes trial, perhaps the first of many. Cal Perry is live in Kyiv just ahead. Stay close. We do not know what consequences Vladimir Putin will face for the war in Ukraine, if any. But today, a Ukrainian court began holding his military accountable. A 21-year-old Russian soldier is the defendant in the first war crimes trial. Prosecutors accused the young man of shooting a civilian in the head in the early days of the invasion. He faces life in prison if convicted. So far, he has not entered a plea. Also, the Pentagon says it reopened a diplomatic channel with Russia today. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin called his Russian counterpart and called for a ceasefire. It was the first conversation they have had since the invasion, but apparently it did not lead to any breakthroughs. And President Biden spoke to the leaders of Finland and Sweden about joining NATO. Russia's not happy about that move, especially since it shares more than 800 miles of border with Finland. NBC's Cal Perry is in Kiev tonight with more. And Cal, let's start with this war crimes trial. Why is it so important that a formal trial take place? Uh, well, for a number of reasons, I think it's important, obviously, for Ukrainians to document what happened, what's happened in this war, how so many civilians were killed. This young man is charged with the killing of an unarmed 62-year-old man who was riding his bicycle home uh, when the unit that, that this young sergeant is a part of, which was apparently sort of cut in half, they were fleeing back to Russia in civilian vehicles. Allegedly, according to prosecutors, this, this young man uh, murdered that 62-year-old man. Uh, again, four days into the invasion, allegedly he was ordered to do so. The video that we're watching is important in and of itself because Ukrainian prosecutors, as they say, are hoping that this will save the lives of Ukrainian civilians in the eastern part of the country. They're hoping uh, against hope, really, that maybe this ends up on social media, that maybe Russian soldiers will see this. Um, and beyond the accountability, um, they're hoping that this will serve uh, as a deterrence. It is unusual. Of course it's unusual. It is it's most unusual because the war is still going on because this is a Ukrainian court. This is outside the ICC's jurisdiction. Um, but again, it is important for Ukrainians to do this, not just for accountability for the Ukrainian civilians who have died, uh, but to send a message. And again, uh, it's not clear that anybody in Russia at least is going to see this on the normal sort of news channels. Um, it would be on social media. And, and that's what officials here are hoping for, Joshua. Tell us more about this phone call between Secretary Lloyd Austin and his Russian counterpart. I I'm sure it didn't yield any sudden agreement that the war would end, but what did they talk about? How did this come about? What, what do we know about the call? So certainly important in the fact that it happened at all, right? It was initiated, we understand, by the American side, uh, that according to the readout from both countries, there was a brief readout, a brief report uh, from both countries. On the United States readout, um, it said that General Austin called for an immediate ceasefire and called for a continuation of dialogue to keep this line uh, of communication open. The Russian readout, a, a little bit different, said they concentrated on international security issues and the situation in Ukraine. Didn't mention that ceasefire um, and didn't mention the time of the call. Now, we understand from U.S. officials the call lasted an hour. Hour, um, which is saying something, considering that these two uh, men haven't spoken in over two months. Um, nothing more substantial other than that. Certainly no uh, traction on the ceasefire. When you listen to Ukrainian officials today, and we heard President Zelensky talking tonight, uh, it doesn't seem like that is ongoing anyway, any direct conversations. In fact, um, the, the most recent word we've heard from President Zelensky um, is that the Russians have shown an inability to negotiate fairly. And, and so he says it's really, uh, it's really a non-starter, Joshua. So we had President Biden speaking to the leaders of Finland and Sweden today, both angling to join NATO. And again, Finland borders Russia. Sweden's just on the other side of Finland. You've also got this G7 meeting coming up. Their foreign ministers laid the groundwork for a leadership meeting that's coming up. Talk to us more about what happened today, both with the president in Germany and, and what all of this diplomacy means for the war. Well, I, I think it's, it's diplomacy um, that has great implications for the war, certainly when you talk about funding and when you talk about sanctions, and a lot of the conversations were, were about sanctions, certainly on the G7 side, how to increase sanctions, how to, again, tweak those sanctions. Um, they're going now after uh, personal members of Putin's family, uh, including a, a, a person that he's rumored to sort of be dating. Um, and then uh, when it comes to the Finland and, and Sweden, um, I think you're starting to see preparations for, for what could come from the Russian side. Um, there's talk of Russians 
starting to cut off um, electricity uh, to Finland. That, that news sort of broke uh, this evening. Now, the Russians say that they're going to stop uh, supplying electricity to Finland over a billing issue, but the timing of that is, is pretty suspicious, to say the least, um, that they're going to stop that. Finland relies on about 10 percent of its power um, from Russia. But it's, it, it's sort of to talk about how to fold in these two nations. Now, one of the things that NATO has been saying is it's going to be easy to fold in these two nations because they already share a security agreement. Great Britain has done what, what Biden has sort of started to lay out the framework for, um, which is an international security pact or a security pact between those countries. In other words, if Finland or Sweden comes under attack, Great Britain has already said that they will step in even before NATO membership. All of that helps sort of pave the roadway, if you like, to NATO membership. And, and for NATO's part, they said that this could happen quickly, that this could happen within a couple of months. So all of these calls, all of this diplomatic activity, I think a sign that everybody is taking this NATO membership seriously. So the wheels are well greased for this to happen. Thank you, Cal. That's NBC's Cal Perry reporting tonight yes, from Kiev. Much appreciated. Yes, we will get to some of today's other top stories in a moment, including a federal case that could reshape immigration at the U.S.-Mexico border and the latest curveball from Elon Musk on his plan to buy Twitter. Tonight's headlines begin with the legal battle over the U.S.-Mexico border. A number of states are taking the Biden administration to court over a policy from the pandemic. President Biden wants to lift this policy, known as Title 42, this month. NBC national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez is at the border in Eagle Pass, Texas, with more. As the immigration debate ramps up ahead of the midterm elections, critics of the Biden administration are heading to court. Attorneys for 21 Republican-led states are suing the administration and the CDC, trying to prevent the administration from lifting Title 42, the public health uh, directive that the Trump administration used to expel many migrants during the pandemic. Supporters of lifting Title 42 say that it's inhumane and that, that it denies migrants uh, searching for asylum their rights. But opponents of lifting Title 42 say it will lead to an even bigger surge. And indeed, federal authorities say that they've seen more than 221 border crossings in March alone, and the Department of Homeland Security is preparing for up to 18,000 migrants a day to cross if Title 42 is lifted. Now, both sides went to court on Friday in Lafayette, Louisiana, trying to prove their case. The judge, who was appointed by President Trump, did not issue a ruling on Friday, but said that he would make a decision by May 23rd. That is the day the Biden administration had wanted to lift the policy. Thank you, Gabe. That's NBC's Gabe Gutierrez reporting from the U.S.-Mexico border. Will Elon Musk buy Twitter or not? A few weeks ago, he announced plans to acquire it for $44 billion. This morning, he introduced some serious doubt with a tweet. He wrote that the deal is temporarily on hold while he figures out the exact number of spam bots and fake accounts on the site. Twitter says that less than 5% of its apparent users are not real people. Fighting fake accounts is one of Mr. Musk's stated goals in buying the company. This morning, he sent a follow-up tweet to that one saying that he is, quote, still committed to acquisition. NBC technology correspondent Jake Ward joins us now. And Jake, I don't even know what to think at this point. If he is serious about buying Twitter, he's got a funny way of showing it. You know, this is the thing, right? We're watching him kneecap his own deal before it is approved by regulators and before it's been approved by shareholders. And really the big question here is, what is he doing, right? Is he in some way trying to change the value of Twitter so that he can get a better price, renegotiate? Is he trying to push the stock price of Tesla in some weird way? And all of that, will it get him into trouble with the SEC for, you know, tweeting a public statement that could conceivably be construed as manipulating the share price. We're definitely seeing at this point that it is hurting Twitter. I mean, at this point, we're, we're seeing uh, Twitter having fallen by about five bucks since yesterday. You know, it's a big drop for that company. So he is literally devaluing the thing that he is lining up to buy. And, and it's just strange to see that kind of move from someone who ostensibly wants to own this car that he's dinging with a hammer. <laughs> Yeah, Twitter, I mean, you look at the stock over the weekend, it just immediately goes, 
was the minute that he made that announcement, the stock price took a very strong hit today and lost a fair amount of its value. But with regard to fake users on Twitter, in fairness, that is a legitimate concern about not just Twitter, but all social media, right? Because we've been trying to suss out, I know you have been, and I know other tech reporters who've been trying to figure out how much of what we see is real and how much is fake, especially because the technology is so good to generate accounts that seem real, to create faces in AI that don't exist with real people, to deep fake people. We just don't actually know how much of social media is real people and That's how right. much is bots. That's right. Twitter has, for its part, estimated that, you know, about 5% or less of its users are spam bots. But you're absolutely right, Joshua. I mean, every major front when it comes to the information warfare we see online uh, is filled with spam bots, right? The automation of, of bots to impersonate real, peel, real people, we saw it uh, push during the election. We see it push during major world events. I mean, those are the weapons of modern warfare. So it is undoubtedly a problem. The thing is, it doesn't seem quite reasonable for Elon Musk to be complaining about them now, seeing as how when he first announced his intention to acquire Twitter, he mentioned spam bots, so it's something he obviously knew about. And in Securities and Exchange Commission filings, Twitter has announced that they have them. So this is not a big surprise here, Joshua. There's also been some some HR issues in Silicon Valley lately. Uber CEO Dara Khosrowshahi recently said that they're going to treat hiring as a privilege, almost like a luxury that the company may or may not be able to afford. There have been reports of layoffs at Twitter, some high-level executives who've left. What's going on internally? Is this specific to Twitter, or is this more kind of the tech sector dealing with today's economy? I think it's very much the latter. You know, when I speak to software engineers across this industry about trying to find a job right now, you know, people who would have been batting offers away a couple of years ago right now find themselves hard pressed to get anyone to return an email. So there's very much the sense that these tech companies are beginning to tighten up or beginning to downsize. And you see that specifically in the CEO of Twitter putting out, uh, you know, a, a memo just uh, this week that said we need to start, you know, we're hiring, we're doing a hiring freeze. He announced the ouster of these two top executives, and he basically asked, we need to cut back on travel, cut back on events, save money as if it were your own. So I think we're seeing a tightening all through the sector, and Elon Musk just happens to be buying this company in the middle of that. And before I have to let you go, uh, Elon Musk did tweet yesterday kind of reiterating that he believed that former President Trump should be restored to Twitter, though he wrote that he believes a less divisive candidate would be better in 2024. Has he given any other indications of what the culture of Twitter might be like under his ownership if indeed he acquires it? You know, it's not clear at all. I think, you know, you and I know, right, this is not a man with any experience with media, even advertising. And so it's really not at all clear what it's going to be other than perhaps a very freewheeling place. That's sort of been his attitude about this. You know, I think ultimately, though, before we get to that point, the thing we have to remember is that there are many, many things now standing in the way of Elon Musk actually acquiring this company, not the least of which is the fall in Tesla's share price. Tesla, as you'll recall, is the collateral. His shares in Tesla is the collateral he's putting up against the loans he's taken out to try and buy Twitter. Well, if those, if the value of those shares falls to 43%, he gets hit with a margin call. He's got to basically pay back or sell shares or put up more collateral. Right now, over the last month, they've fallen by about 30%. He's only about 13% away from that margin call. So it is by far, it's not at all a foregone conclusion that he's going to buy this thing. But if he does, a very freewheeling future is what Twitter's in store for. Thank you, Jake. That's NBC Tech correspondent Jake Ward filling us in on the latest with Twitter. In New Jersey, concerns over gas prices are fueling a campaign to change how that state sells gasoline. If you live in the Northeast, you might already know this, but New Jersey is the only state that bans pumping your own gas. Self-service stations are prohibited by law. But with gas prices surging, dozens of stations in the Garden State gave drivers a bit of a break today. More than 70 of them slashed their prices for people who pumped their own gas. Now, the savings vary, typically 15, 20 cents a gallon, but a campaign is on to change this law. Opinions on lifting the ban are mixed. Growing up in Jersey, which is 93, I have never pumped the gas in my life. So just to change it now, it just seems like they're, they're trying to get over on us. 
Last month, a Monmouth University poll found 54% of respondents said they supported a self-service option. 37% said they support having self-service only. What issues are driving voters to the polls this year? Student loans are definitely on that list. Back in April, the Biden administration extended its pause on federal student loan payments. That moratorium is set to expire at the end of August, and some new graduates are facing the reality of this financial burden. NBC's Shaq Brewster reports from the swing state of Wisconsin, where many college graduates are looking for relief. This weekend in Madison, a new class of college graduates. For some, the realization of crushing debt. I'm graduating with about $65,000 in student loan debt. With $25,000 of student loan debt. And I'm graduating with no student loans. Thank you, Mom and Dad. About $70,000. And it kind of sucks. I'm not feeling too great about that. Experts say it's a student loan crisis. The cost of college higher than ever. More than 43 million Americans owing a collective $1.7 trillion in college debt. For this group of friends, more than $150,000 borrowed. Something that is on your mind always, like it informs every decision that you make after you graduate. Now presidential political pressure is growing. Biden lost my trust because I'm a college student, so that student loan slogan was really, really something that we look forward to. In 2020, then-candidate Biden followed his progressive colleagues, supporting federal forgiveness of some student loans. I proposed and, and the House, Nancy, put it in the plan to immediately provide $10,000 in debt relief as stimulus right now. The White House now teasing an announcement within the coming weeks as a pandemic-driven pause on federal loan repayments started under the Trump administration and extended by Biden is set to expire August 31st, weeks before the start of early voting in many states. An issue you're thinking about for the midterm elections? Absolutely. Without a real commitment to it, I think there's going to be... Uh, some people who aren't very interested in voting, um, and that's pretty sad. A poll by a progressive think tank shows debt cancellation could impact voter turnout. 45% of voters in battleground states say that with $10,000 in debt cancellation, they are somewhat or much more likely to vote in November, the number jumping to 56% among young voters. Democratic lawmakers argue canceling student debt is a matter of racial justice. The big question is how much can it address? The wealth inequality, the racial wealth gap in America is vast and student loans are maybe a drop in that bucket. The prospect of cancellation already facing threats of legal challenges and political opposition. It's just a bad idea in general. Now the president of the college Republicans, Cranch transferred from a private college freshman year to avoid taking on more student debt. I think it would be really unfair, especially when you consider hardworking citizens uh, who didn't go to college and who don't have those burdens of loans, but where's their money? Where's their relief? Last month, five Republican senators introduced a bill to block future pauses in student loan payments and prevent Biden from unilaterally canceling student debt. The big winners coming from canceling student loan debt, it's not the students. It's going to be the colleges who now have even more of an incentive to hike up prices. As the cloud of doubt and debt hangs over the excitement of graduation season. That's NBC's Shaq Brewster reporting. Now, we want to continue this conversation on student loan debt next week. Tell us, how have your life and your finances been affected by student loans? I certainly know mine have, but what would it mean for you if your debt was forgiven? Share your story with us. We are at NBC Now Tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Leave us a brief but brilliant voicemail, 888-575-2NBC, or email nowtonight at NBCNews.com. She just made history at the top of Mount Everest. Lester Holt introduces us to the youngest American woman to reach the summit before we go. Time for our special series, Inspiring America. And tonight we meet a teenager from Illinois who set her sights high, really high, and made it all the way to the top of Mount Everest. She shared her story with NBC's Lester Holt. The climb took her to the top of the world, 18-year-old Lucy Westlake becoming the youngest American woman to conquer Mount Everest. Just to be at the top, it was really surreal. I spoke with her shortly after. Our connection was spotty, but her passion was clear. So when you got to the top, did you say something? Did you laugh, scream? 
I actually, I just said to myself, I was like, I'm at the top of the world. Like, I, I really couldn't believe it. It took her 26 days to reach the peak, but Lucy has been climbing toward this moment for most of her life. She grew up climbing with her dad starting at age seven and never let fear limit her dreams. You were at one point afraid of heights? Yeah, I was. I, when I was little, I had to conquer that fear because I love the mountains. Last year, she became the youngest woman to reach the highest point in each of the 50 states. Does self-doubt ever creep in? Yeah, looking up at uh, Everest from Camp 4, uh, that was the final camp, and it was like... Man, it looked impossible, but you just got to put one foot in front of the other, like break it down, keep it small, and just believe in yourself. She's now tackling the Explorer's Grand Slam, a climbing challenge reaching the highest peak on each continent and trekking to the North and South Poles. She's now more than halfway there. What is it like to keep pushing the limits? That's really one of the reasons I, I climb mountains. I just love like to see how far my body and mind can go. It's challenging, it's not comfortable, it's, but that's like, that's the point. I mean, that's, that's really where you grow as a person. Well said, that's NBC's Lester Holt reporting. Now next week we'll meet two more people reaching great heights. Chal Lindgren and Jessica Watkins, they will answer your questions and we are so geeked for this. From aboard the International Space Station, Send your questions for these astronauts to answer from space. We are at NBC Now tonight on social media. Leave us a brief but brilliant voicemail, 888-575-2NBC, or email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. Parents, if you've got kids who are fascinated with space, have them send in a question. We would love to send them to the astronauts. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thank you for making time for us. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.